be reading from Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, starting with verse 38. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken from her. Let's pray. Our Father, I pray that you would disclose yourself through your word this morning. Lord, let us be a people who are receptive to your spirits uh, prompting in our lives. Let us respond in the way that you would have us to respond. And Lord, uh, let, it, uh, let it be a meaningful time together as it already has been, uh, both for us and for you. So we yield ourselves to you now. Pray that you would teach us and offer this prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Well, it's my, you can be seated. Yeah. It is my privilege to be here this morning. I'm uh, very glad to be here. I bring you greetings from the Religion Department of ETBU. I also bring you greetings from a sister church here in Marshall, Texas, Emmanuel Baptist Church, where I serve as the college ministry leader. And I also want to express my gratitude to uh, the gentleman leading uh, worship this morning is always encouraging to me to uh, assemble with other believers and sing true and meaningful things, which I think we have done this morning. I also want to extend my uh, appreciation to Craig for the opportunity to uh, speak with you this morning. This is something that uh, he asked me probably, I don't know, probably two years ago now. It's been going on trying to make this happen, so I was, gl- I was glad to finally have the opportunity to, uh, to be here with you. And uh, most of all, I want to express my gratitude to, uh, to you guys for uh, what you were able to do with my youngest two children who were part of the children's choir for, on the Wednesday nights until we unfortunately moved uh, too far out of town to continue. But uh, the, the, the impact that, uh, that your church has made on my kids for the past two years, uh, my wife and I very much appreciate uh, what you're doing with the kids and encourage you to keep doing that. So thank you. Uh, thank you for doing that. Well, as you know, we're sit, uh, we sit here just a mere two days away from the turn of the new year when we will once again you know, get a new calendar and begin to uh, make preparations and then execute those, those plans for the coming year. And uh, the new year is always a good time of reflection, I think. I'm kind of a contemplative guy anyway, but uh, the new year in particular lends itself to this opportunity to reflect on things. And you know, I encourage you to uh, take a few moments. It's a busy season, I know, but uh, take a few moments and reflect on the lessons learned this past year and make sure that those lessons aren't lost. Uh, take time to kind of lock down some of those good memories of this past year, those things that you don't want to, that you don't want to fall by the wayside and forget about uh, what happened back in May or something like that. So take time to do that. And then also, I think it's appropriate to, uh, to look ahead and of course, when we talk about looking ahead, we're talking about one of the things uh, that many people do during this time of year, one of these tr- common traditions we have, in addition to hog jowl and black-eyed peas and college football, it's making resolutions. Now, uh, some of you may not be resolution makers. I understand that. There's great reasons not to. Uh, I want to uh, read to you a little passage from uh, humor columnist Dave Barry, and if you're not familiar with Dave Barry... I'm glad to acquaint you with him, but here's what Dave Barry has to say about New Year's resolutions, and this may capture the sentiments of some of you. Uh, He writes this, why make New Year's resolutions? Because you can be a better person. I bet you know somebody who seems to be perfect, somebody who always looks terrific, somebody who manages to devote plenty of time to both family and career, somebody whose house is spotless, whose children are well-behaved, and whose dog does not smell as if it sleeps on on a bed of decomposing raccoons. You wonder, how does that person, quote, do it all, uh, don't you? Well, stop wondering and do something. Start right now. Get up off the sofa, put on some active sportswear, and go strangle that person. All right? that's, uh, that's good. Uh, he goes on to say this. He goes on to talk about making resolutions. And he says, you know, the problem is that a lot of people in their resolutions, they, they, set the, they set their sights too high, he says. He goes, and he says this. In making New Year's resolution, pick a goal that you can reasonably expect to attain as we see in these examples. So an unrealistic goal would be this. In the next month, I will lose 25 pounds. He says, no, a more realistic goal is this. Over the next year, taking it an ounce or two at a time, I will gain 25 pounds, 
and my face will bloat like a military life raft, all right? So, yeah, I was like, okay. Uh, how about this one? Uh, an unrealistic goal is read a good book. He says, no, a more realistic goal is this, to uh, look at the outside of some good books and then waddle over to the pastry section of the bookstore, right? And then finally this, an unrealistic goal is this, uh, I will learn to speak Chinese. He says, no, a more realistic goal is this, I will order some Chinese food, all right? So, you know, it's all about uh, keeping, keeping things in balance, right? Being realistic. So uh, resolutions are one of these things. If you're anything like me, it's, uh, it's a string of failures, all right, through the years that uh, we have these ideas and they didn't pan out. And so uh, maybe, maybe you uh, are in that same boat as I. And so uh, this whole concept of making resolutions doesn't appeal much to you because of your track record. I understand that. But uh, I also want to consider this. Uh, G.K. Chesterton, who's uh, probably a little more wise than Dave Barry, I'm sure, he, he sees New Year's resolutions as a, as a bit of a more noble enterprise. And he writes this, The object of a new year is not that we should have a new year, is that we should have a new soul and a new nose, new feet, a new backbone, new ears and new eyes. Unless a particular man made New Year's resolutions, he would make no resolutions. Unless a man starts fresh about things, he will certainly do nothing effective. And I think Chesterton... Uh, share some good wisdom there. This, this idea of taking time to make changes. Because we think about time, uh, time doesn't need a calendar. Time is going to continue to go on and progress with or without a calendar. Uh, the calendar is something that we've created, right, to get a handle on things. And so what Chesterton as asserts is this, uh, we ought to take advantage of this time of the new year because it affords us an opportunity to avoid the danger of just continuing to keep on rocking along just as time does, but to stop and consider maybe we shouldn't just keep rocking along as we always have. Maybe it's time for changes. And that's what I think Chesterton uh, wants us to think about. And I appreciate that. And so this morning, I want us to take the occasion of this, uh, this new year and consider the passage that we've read and see that this passage is especially timely as we stand here on this threshold of the new year and to consider uh, what might be in here for us, those of us who are um, uh, thinking about perhaps setting some New Year's resolutions. And I suggest to you that in this passage, we're going to see that Jesus challenged His followers to defer other things, even good things, for the best things. I think we'll see how he's going to uh, make that challenge both to his followers of the time and also to us. Well, as was his pattern, Jesus has been going from village to village throughout the area. And in Luke's gospel, he is making his way to Jerusalem. And as he has done before, he has come to a certain village. And he even instructed, if you go back and look earlier on in chapter 10, he instructed his 72 missionaries, we'll call them, to go to various villages and find a person of peace. And when that person of peace was found, he says, enter that person's house and receive whatever they offer you to eat and, and stay there as long as, uh, as long as they will have you. And so we see that that particular pattern Jesus seems to follow right here as he comes to a certain village, Luke calls it, we know from John's gospel that this was Bethany, comes to a certain village and Martha proves to be this person of peace. And Martha extends the invitation to Jesus, inviting him and perhaps his disciples, but uh, Jesus in particular inviting Jesus into her home for a meal. And it's important to think about hospitality in the first century. This is an important, uh, this is an important concept that was uh, a part of this culture and a part of how things were done. And the extension of hospitality was, was a critical feature of the time in this particular culture. And it was imperative uh, for the woman in particular to make her guest feel very welcome, to accommodate his or her needs as much as possible and that's what we see going on right here. She goes to great lengths to welcome Jesus into her home and to prepare for Him. And you've got to understand where she's coming from. The caliber of the guests that she's invited to her home demands a, a, measure, of, a, a measure of preparation. Uh, Martha seemed to recognize this. And, and in fact, if you look in the passage here, her, her reference to Jesus as Lord there in verse 40 throughout Luke's gospel, this, is often, this title is often used uh, as, a, as a, a term used by those who have granted their allegiance to Jesus, His followers, if you will. And so 
When Martha calls him Lord, I think we can, I think we can understand from this passage right here that Martha wasn't just uh, one, of the, you know, one of the freeloading crowds looking for Jesus to do some kind of miracle for her or something like that. She had already bought into his message enough that she understood, at least to a degree, who she was welcoming into her home. And so as we move through the passage, what we're going to see here is the key element of this passage is this contrast that Luke is going to set up between these two characters of the story. And the first, uh, the first component we, are, we find in verse 39. And so in verse 39, we are introduced to Martha's sister, Mary. And it says that uh, inside the house, Mary took her place at the Lord's feet and was sitting and listening to His teachings. Now, his, her posture is, is important to note here because um, during this time, a rabbi would take disciples, would take students, and they would figuratively sit under him to glean from him, to, to uh, understand his teachings, to see how he, uh, how he did life. And so for Mary to, as described here, sit at the Lord's feet, she was literally taking the place of a disciple. Of Jesus, and so that seems to signify the the uh, her her understanding of Jesus's uh, p- position and his authority. Well, with this de- with this description of Mary, right, taking her place at the Lord's feet, we move into the other side, the contrasting figure, and that is of Martha. And so this begins in verse forty, where we see the uh, we see the the foil, if you will. And so while Mary was sitting and listening, we find Martha is busy about the activities of getting things ready. I mean, the meals don't cook themselves, right? And so someone has to make the effort to make these things happen. And so she is making such effort. And so she is preoccupied with, uh, with the preparations, necessary preparations that must be done. You cannot have house guests if you're not going to... Uh, if you're not going to make the effort to feed them, right? And so she is about these preparations. And at some point, though, during her preparation, she pauses from that, uh, that feverish activity and she goes to Jesus for help. And note part of the contrast here, while Mary is sitting and listening, Martha is talking. That's going to become important here in a minute. And in fact, she asked, she asked Jesus a question, uh, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work? And in the construction, in the original language, this question uh, is intended to elicit a positive response. In other words, uh, she believed that Jesus did in fact care that uh, that her sister had left her to do all the work. That she she was confident that Jesus uh, was compassionate, that He did care, that He was just. And as He assessed the situation, He would certainly side with her that it was not right for Mary to be plopped down at his feet while she's doing all the work. And so she looked to Jesus and his authority to tell her sister, get off your keister and go help, your, uh, you know, go help Martha, right? And so you can almost hear her frustration there in verse 40, tell her to help me, right? So exasperated at her lazy sister, she says, tell her to help. Me. She'll listen to you. Tell her to get up and help. And as you think about Martha's situation, I mean, I think her concern is pretty legitimate. As we already said, uh, meals don't prepare themselves, and the person who is, who is in her home is one who deserves uh, all, the, um, all the best preparation. And she's trying to serve her guests. She's trying to, uh, to offer hospitality, as was expected there in the first century. She's, she's working herself feverishly. Obviously, she could use the help. And if this teacher was who she thought he was, then he would certainly come alongside her, back her up, and say, yes, this is the way that it ought to be. And honestly, I think if we put ourselves in this situation, would we not all side with Martha? Like, come on, what do you, you can't sit around when all this work's to be done. Perhaps you're thinking about, yeah, it was just like last week, you know, at my house when all these people weren't doing anything except watching football or, or something, you know, it's like, yeah, come on, get up, help, help out, right? That's just the right thing to do, right? It's, it's, it's the good thing to do. But as he often did, Jesus answers Martha's question, but does so in a way that uh, she did not expect. It started off well. He says, Martha, Martha. And this, is a, this is an emotive uh, a phrase here. Uh, Jesus uh, is very tender in his response, I think. Uh, Martha, Martha. He recognizes that she had become overwhelmed by her task, that she was... Uh, as he says, anxious and troubled about these things, right? So 
he read the situation accurately and understood exactly where she was coming from and uh, recognized her, her, not only her, her feverish activity, but her frustration. Her, her plans to serve the Lord had made her frazzled. And, she, and Jesus acknowledged this. And so, you know, he was, he was in, he, his finger was on the pulse of the situation. But then his response took an unexpected turn. Instead of commending her for her efforts, instead of thanking her for working so hard, and instead of rebuking Mary for sitting around, Jesus essentially turns that rebuke, albeit a mild one, onto Martha herself. Look back at verse 42. He says, Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken from her. See, Jesus uh, completely inverted what, Mary, or what Martha thought was the case. What she thought was the case was that there was an injustice being served here and and Jesus, the authoritative teacher, was the one who could make it right. Jesus says, no, Martha, you've misunderstood things. You have things out of kilter. And this question, you know, when she said, don't you care? In reality, he did care, but he just didn't care about the things that she cared about. She, he cared about something more substantive, more meaningful. These many things had stolen her attention from the Lord who sat in her house and was likely sitting there with Mary teaching her about the kingdom of God and, and explaining to her Old Testament scriptures and God's fulfillment through the ages and also probably answering her questions. And meanwhile, Martha's running around furiously trying to get things ready, trying to uh, make everything uh, just right. And if we consider her position, I, I, let me offer you this example. I think it will illustrate this. Uh, uh, someone was in the news recently, George W. Bush. If you didn't see his eulogy for his father, it was fantastic. I encourage you to check it out. But let's say, you know, after church service here, you realize, oh, you know, we forgot the bread. And so you've got to run down to Kroger and, and, and go get some bread. And there in Kroger, lo and behold, is George W. Bush. And you start to talk with him. And he says, well, do you have lunch plans? He says, well, as a matter of fact, I don't. And you say, well, come over to my house, all right? And so George W. Bush is going to be your, your lunch guest today. And so he comes over to the house, but instead of uh, sitting down and talking to him about his dad and about his legacy and about his presidency and about his life and his family and all those kind of things, you go run to the kitchen or trying to whip up some kind of fabulous lunch, leaving him out there watching the Cowboys or something, all right? So he's sitting there in the living room just uh, hanging out. Would you not be squandering an opportunity to visit with someone like that while you tried to make sure that the cheese dip was just right? I mean, was, was, can we not see that that, was a, that would be a foolish, foolish thing to do? Similarly, Martha missed it. Martha missed it. To paraphrase Jesus, Martha, you missed it. Mary got it, All right? And it's easy for us, you know, in hindsight to look at Martha and like, wow, that was, that was really a dopey thing to do, Martha. But really, I mean, this is one of these things that gets lost in the moments, all right, because in Martha's, you know, in Martha's uh, view of things, everything that she was doing was, was right. I mean, her motivation was pure. She wasn't trying to impress Jesus, just trying to take care of his needs. Uh, her attempt was noble, trying to, you know, accommodate all the things we've already talked about. Uh, and she was trying to serve her guest, this guest, this great miracle worker and teacher, Jesus of Nazareth, this prophet. Uh, that had come into her home. She was just trying to take care of him. And, you know, when you think about it, even Jesus never said what she was doing was a bad thing. All he said was, Martha, you missed the best thing. You missed the best thing. And I think when you think about this situation, it, it, it's going to uh, lead well into us. You know, I wish Luke would finish the story and tell us what happened after this, but I, 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 can, I think we can infer that they probably just had peanut butter sandwiches that, uh, that day, and they saved the fatted calf for another time, All right? So Martha probably got the point and, and uh, wised up. But the question now turns to us is, what do we do about this? You know, how does this, how does this, uh, this story here... Uh, impact us. And this is one of the great things about the Gospels is that they use these stories and examples of real people in real time to instruct us and so that we can uh, learn from uh, their, their goods and their bads. And so I think what we see here for us is that the principle of the story continues to be one that each of us can also apply ourselves because uh, Jesus continues to call us, His followers, 
to defer things, even good things, for the best thing. The lesson for Martha is the same lesson for us. And this is a great, it's a great thing for us to consider here on the front, of the, the front of the new year as we consider resolutions. And this is a resolution that I would encourage all of us to, uh, to make and what I've been challenged myself to, uh, to embrace uh, personally. Uh, because uh, as you know, everybody's busy, right? And so uh, we've all got some place to be. We have all have someone to meet and we all have something to fix and we all have some bill to pay and some... Uh, some meeting to make and someone to help and uh, something to be done and someone to get with and so on and so on. There's always something. And many of those things are really good things, uh, things that uh, we ought to be doing. The problem is, though, is that sometimes this furious activity to do all these things and to see all these people and to fix all these things can distract us from the best thing. And this is the lesson of the passage. You know, a, a minor point of application here, I think, is, is something... Uh, kind of some, some wisdom that comes out of this text is to always ask ourselves when this flurry of activity comes and we're faced with various choices like I have some extra time or I have some extra money or I have some extra whatever it is. Uh, we're always going to have these choices. What am I going to do with that? And so I think part of this passage would, would say just in wisdom, always ask yourself this question, all right? If I have this extra, what is the best use of this extra? What is the best use of my time, the best use of my resources, the best use of my money? And we can, we can ask ourselves this question, you know, as we face these decisions day after day after day, what is the best of the competing options that I have? And that's a good and it's a, it's a wise thing to do. And I encourage, uh, you know, encourage you, encourage me to always make, always make those choices. But I don't think that's the real point in the passage. I don't think that's, uh, that's, a, that's a side note, if you will, but that's not what's really going on here. Instead, I think... This passage actually describes what is the best thing. We don't, have to, we don't have to get into this, well, is this better than this, so this must be the best? No, I think the passage says this, what, this is what is the best thing, and the best thing is sitting at the Lord's feet and listening to what He says. And doesn't that sound real good? It sounds real spiritual, right? Great, that sounds great. But, you know, uh, I haven't seen the Lord's feet lately uh, for me to sit at, and uh, He doesn't talk to me with my ears. And so, you know, uh, it sounds super spiritual, sit at the Lord's feet and listen to what He says, but, you know, how do we do that? You know, how do we, how do we make this a reality since He's not here for me to sit at His feet? Well, the best thing, if we can put it in terms uh, more familiar to us perhaps, is to spend time in fellowship with the Lord. This is the best thing. This is what this passage compels us to do. And this is what being a disciple entails. Mary here is the example of the disciple. And what does the disciple do? Sits at the Lord's feet and listens. She spends time in fellowship with the Lord. And so back to our situation, we don't have the flesh and blood Jesus to uh, sit at, uh, His feet to sit at. We don't have His voice to hear with our ears. And so what do we do? Well, we do what has come to be done by Christians throughout the ages, and we spend fellowship with the Lord through spending time in the Scripture. Right? Because this is, what, this is what He has to say, is, is uh, codified for us in the, in the text. If you want to hear from the Lord, this is where we find Him. This is where He speaks to us. We also spend time with the Lord in prayer. Um, something, you know, we could spend uh, months and months talking about prayer. But you think the thing about prayer is that uh, prayer so often is asking, asking, asking. But prayer, uh, more so, at least should be about being still, following Mary's example, listening and uh, understanding what the Lord wants us to hear, to be attentive to His voice because He does still speak even today. And then I think we have each other. We have each other. We have gatherings like this where we can come together and be encouraged by one another and hear from one another, not just what do you think and what do you think, what do you think, but how is the Lord speaking to you, speaking through you to me? These are the, these are the things that can happen when we get together like this. The best thing is to know Him. The best thing is to know what He wants. The best thing is to know what He desires. The best thing is to know what He values. And that best thing only comes when we spend time with Him and come to know Him.
But the best thing takes effort. It does not happen by accident. And this is good. It takes us back to Chesterton. If we don't make the effort to make those resolutions, then nothing changes. No one will be effective. Did you know that some people can spend months and months and even years, even those in vocational ministry who ascend pulpits and lead music and uh, guide churches, they can spend months and months and months and even years doing all the Lord's furious activity, but not being in fellowship with the Lord. I'm telling you, it can happen, and it does happen. And so it cannot, the best thing cannot happen without the efforts to make it happen. And so the challenge to you and the challenge to me at this new year is to make this our resolution, to seek the best thing. And how to do that? Well, that's a question for each of us to answer. Does it mean setting our alarm at a different time? Does it mean saying no to this thing and saying yes to this thing? Does it mean uh, rescheduling things in order that we might have that fellowship with the Lord the best thing? Because if you don't know how, if you don't know where to start, I assure you your church has resources here that will help you to make the best thing a part of your life. And that is a resolution I think we can all get behind and that we all must get behind as disciples of Christ. Let's pray together. Our Father, what a fabulous invitation that you have given to us to learn from you to know you and to know your ways and to, uh, to live a life that is not haphazard or, or hapless or just trying to figure this thing out, Lord. But you have invited us to partner with you, to hear from you, and to know you, to, as this passage leads us, to be your disciple. But Lord, you do not make us follow We must make the effort to follow. So, Lord, I pray for each one of us here as we think about the new year and as uh, the calendar does change. Lord, let us us make this resolution to seek the best thing, something that uh, that we seek daily to make a reality. Lord, aid us in that pursuit. Give each one of us uh, the wisdom to know how each one of us needs to make seeking the best thing a part of our lives for this coming year. And Lord, in doing so, I pray that you would grant us the wisdom to uh, make those decisions of those competing choices that we will often face. But Lord, let us be the kind of people that you want us to be, and we know that that occurs when we do the things that you want us to do. And that is the best thing. So Lord, aid us in that pursuit and guide us by your Spirit. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.